Hello, everybody. You're listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. Right. So, uh, yeah, okay. I guess it is time for us to do another news episode. In, in fact, it is overdue uh, time for, for us to do another news episode. Because uh, we didn't really do one last month, did we? Um, no, because uh, you, know, you had been busy and uh, we needed a little bit of time to to breathe again but uh yeah we we decided we decided to kind of do what we did last time and and combine two months into an episode again mm-hmm. for y'all yeah so uh that's what you're seeing here and um i guess just to talk about uh what i was busy with or at least one of the main things i was busy with because it's a it's a pretty major move i guess kind of literally because um this is the first episode we're recording from my new place that I moved to uh, less than a month ago, really. And the reason I moved was because I have gotten a job, uh, basically. Um, I am now a, um, what they call a junior research fellow at Jesus College at the University of Cambridge. So. That's, uh, honestly, I'm pretty astonished that um, I got this position. It is, um, it is a very, very competitive position. Um, and in fact, it is open to pretty much all early career scientists who have gotten their PhDs recently. Um, and so, yeah, I, I am just flabbergasted (laughs) that I I managed to get the, get the job, um. So I've actually known about this for a little while, but I haven't wanted to talk. I didn't want to talk about it before I actually like started the job. Um, the day that I learned that I um, got the job, in, well, actually, the day that I interviewed for the job was the same day that um, I had my PhD Viva. And then later that same day, after both of these those things were done, both the interview and the Viva were done, I got the email telling me that I got the job. <laughs> it was like... Whoa. Um, so yeah, I guess that's basically my second birthday now. Um, hmm. And so, yeah, what, what does this job entail anyway? So um, the junior research fellowships are a sort of special kind of um, postdoc position. So a, a postdoc is basically a researcher who has gotten their PhD, but they haven't started their own lab yet. Um and so oftentimes they might join the lab of an established um, senior researcher um, and kind of work with them for a while on various projects, uh, maybe help supervise some of their students um, before hopefully eventually uh, finding um, a place for themselves. Um, and a, a lot of the time, because the job market is what it is nowadays, um, uh, people might go through multiple postdocs before they finally get a permanent job or you know, sometimes decide to leave academia. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm very happy and uh, relieved that I actually got a, a postdoc position basically straight out of my PhD because that's definitely not a guarantee, um, and especially a very prestigious position like this one. Now, the uh, junior research fellowships, they're pretty much only offered by the universities of Cambridge and Oxford, uh, because these two universities have a very interesting system where they're kind of split up into um, multiple units called that they call colleges. So when I say uh, college in this context, it's not just the same thing as a general university, as you, know, you might sometimes use it. Um, the, basically, the entire university community at these two um, universities are split into all these colleges, which um, you know are composed of people from all different departments and backgrounds. So there, uh, you, you have like you know people studying the arts and the social sciences and the natural sciences, all all kind of working in the in the same college, and and they form this kind of community, I guess, because also um, the it's not just 
the faculty that are divided into these colleges, but um, students are as well. So there are also, you know, undergraduate students who live at the college and spend a lot of their time here and things like that. Um, and each of the colleges often has its own facilities, like dining facilities and uh, libraries even. Um, so, yeah, um, and the one that I'm at, Jesus College, is very nice. Um, I believe it is one of the bigger colleges. There's even a nature trail that kind of runs around its perimeter um, at these one, uh, along, like, uh, part of it. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty large um, and composed of, like, several different um, building complexes, um, which is a... Uh, Really, really cool to kind of um, tour for the first time. And there are, there are definitely places here that I, I still haven't really been to. So, yeah, uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and what a junior um, research fellow does around here is basically, um, typically they go for about three years. That's certainly um, what my position um, is. It's a three-year position. And when you apply to them, you uh, basically give them a proposal for what type of research you want to do. And partly based on that is, you know, they're, they're, they're going to um, evaluate whether you're a good, good fit. Once you are, once you are here, uh, you're basically free to conduct that research as, as you want. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very flexible uh, position. Like as postdoc positions go, I would say it basically doesn't get better than this. Um, and not only that, but uh, they actually offer accommodation if you need it. Uh, that is definitely not something that, that you know, typical postdoc positions would, would offer you. Um, and so that, that's the reason why I moved, um, because even though I was already living in Cambridge, um, the, the rent here is not cheap. Um, so uh, when, they, when they said that they were going to offer me accommodation at much, much lower rates um, and, you know, with much of the same living setup as I was already living in before, I, it, was, it was such a good deal. I had to take it. Uh, they basically have uh, several kind of um, what they call sets or uh, kind of apartments uh, within the college for their research fellows to live in. And yeah, that's a, that's pretty darn good. <laughs> and so my, my current um, accommodation also it, it's it's split into a bedroom and a uh, and a living room essentially and I, I've, I've basically been using the living room as kind of also my office or working space and, and there are lots of bookshelves like there are bookshelves like covering three of the four walls um, in in this room uh, so yeah it's a uh, it's pretty good and they, they've definitely thought about what what academics would need um, to live here um, and yeah it, it's a uh, it's been really nice I, I've set in um, pretty well and Cambridge has all kinds of like really interesting um, traditions I suppose you could say so um, basically they had to um, conduct a ceremony uh, where those of us who are new fellows were kind of admitted officially into our positions and so that was one of the first things I did when I moved over here uh, was to attend that ceremony and uh, like we, we had to dress up in gowns similar to how you would uh, dress up for a graduation ceremony. Um, and then each of us new fellows had to go up to the podium and read out the oath of this college in Latin, which is definitely something I've never done before and I don't really expect to ever do again. Um, we, it, it, that, that's quite interesting. Um, and fortunately, they, they did also say that, oh, if you need help with the Latin, um, just let us know beforehand and we can send uh, one, one of our uh, emeritus fellows to, who, who studies classical languages to, to help help you with that, and, <laughs> which is which is kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's been really nice. Um, like uh, we, we also get seven free meals a week at the college, which is also, also a very good deal. Um, like occasionally there are meetings that ev everyone in the college or at least all of the, the um, uh, fellows in the college have to attend but they they come every two months or so so they're not that frequent um, other than that I, I basically have free reign to do um, the research that I want to do and of course I'm still working closely with my uh, PhD supervisor Daniel Field um, because he is one of the you know lecturers at the Department of Earth Sciences here at Cambridge. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still I'm still deeply involved with the lab. So yeah, that, that that's like my main kind of big big update <laughs> that I that I need to share. Um, how how have things been on your end though? Um, well, first of all, uh, I know I've told you this multiple times, 
you know, off off recording, but I am so thrilled and happy for you that you've gotten to be where you are. Um, I've been rooting you rooting for you the whole way, and uh, it's just exciting to hear about your new situation. Um, it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, things have been good on my end. Um, I've been working on things for the show here and there, as well as my personal readings. Um, but uh, I'm happy to say that since it's spoopy month, so to speak, uh, I've definitely been getting in the Halloween spirit as of late, <laughs> which is pretty fun. Mm. Um, uh, now, of course, being in an apartment complex where we are, we don't exactly have a, a, a trick-or-treater situation. So what we've been forced to do is um, kind of go out and seek like Halloween events to go visit. So uh, we found a, a ghost walk at Colonial Williamsburg that we're thinking of doing on the 29th. And uh, that'll be pretty fun, mm. I think. But um, uh, definitely one of the big highlights of, if not this month, but last month, um, I'm happy to say that we have reached 1,000 subscribers. Ooh. <laughs> through time and clades. It was... Oh my god, it was just, it was such a funny thing because so uh, my birthday is on the fifteenth, hmm. and so the day before I was checking our um, you know our, our our messages and stuff, and I saw that we were at nine hundred and ninety nine subscribers, and it was that night on the fourteenth, and I was like, hmm, how how cool would it be if like we got that one thousand subscriber like on my birthday, and wouldn't you know it, it was. In the morning, I checked again, and then, boom, we got it. So, mm. I, we, we do not know who you are, but we want to say thank you, and thank you to everyone <laughs> who helped us get to this point. Um, I mean, it's, it is it is so, like, heartwarming and wonderful to see that we've touched so many people, and so many people want to listen to what we have to say mm -hmm. and share about the, the natural world and, and our human past. So... Uh, um, I'm just so thrilled. And uh, at the time of recording, we got like an additional um, 20 subscribers. Wow. So now we're officially 1,020 subscribers. Hmm. So it's like, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, definitely. We appreciate all of y'all's support. And we're glad that we've been able to provide quality content for everyone interested in natural history. Mm -hmm. So definitely really thrilled about that. Um, got another kind of recent announcement as well um we had talked a couple episodes back i forget which one but it had it involved prehistoric planet i believe mm. which was like one of the paleo documentary highlights of this year that we were getting many more documentaries fairly soon and that they would they would be fleshed out in time and uh, one of those we i remember we talked about was uh, a series hosted by Stephen Fry uh, of the Monty Python fame and whatnot. And uh, we just got the announcement, I think this was just yesterday at the time of recording, of course, that it has a name and we kind of have more of an idea of what this series is about. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Dinosaur with Stephen Fry. And apparently this is going to be a four-day event on Paramount Channel 5 in the UK at least. So I don't know if the States are going to ever see this thing or not. But um, essentially it's Stephen Fry hosting in you know, a very Carl Sagan-esque style. And he goes you know, back to the Mesozoic for a 360 look at the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. and, and they kind of have him out in nature with the big CGI creatures roaming around. Um, and so we got like a, a, a two two minute trailer for that. And um, one thing I've definitely noticed from like the responses of our friends and from people on Twitter that we that we associate with, um, a bit of mixed reactions mm -hmm. for this one. Um, I think it's safe to say that Prehistoric Planet has spoiled us. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, with a budget like they had, which is significantly less than like Marvel films mm -hmm. yet, um, or like big blockbuster films. Um, they managed to pull out some of the most beautiful representations of fossil animals that we had seen in a while. And so looking at this trailer for Dinosaur, 
um it's kind of they're kind of standard fare almost like early 2000s mm -hmm. kind of level of quality for the animals um now that's just from a technological yeah uh, viewpoint because i think accurate like scientific accuracy wise i they look fairly good mm -hmm. i i didn't see too much that irked me um like the the, the proportions on the tyrannosaurs and um there were some i guess they're deinonychus that show up and they were like appropriately feathered yeah um somebody pointed out that the allosaurus has kind of a, a, a too wide of a head yeah but uh and uh, i think like the triceratops feet were too elephantine um but beyond that the animals look fairly good mm -hmm. which is encouraging um so it, it looks like that the crew behind this series did some you know proper homework mm -hmm. on the animal models um but yeah w what do you think albert yeah um i, I guess i i don't have too many thoughts about this just yet um especially um beyond what you've already mentioned but um uh yeah I, I, had, I had very similar impressions like uh the the animals actually look decent for for what they are but um we, we've def we've definitely been been spoiled uh by prehistoric planet in, in that regard um so uh, i i think almost anything is gonna look at it look like a downgrade at this point um mm -hmm. and yeah uh, I, I guess something that i i personally found a bit more interesting um than the cgi animals was actually the fact that they're apparently going to show uh like practical experiments being done by paleontologists and biomechanists and such so oh, people right. do, doing practical experiments to test things like bite force and walking mechanics and such um which seems like it'll be pretty interesting and it actually reminds me a bit of a, a mid-2000s uh, bbc documentary on dinosaurs uh, there were only two episodes but um it it was fairly well presented from what i remember um called the truth about killer dinosaurs um mm -hmm. yeah where they kind of examine sort of various abilities of uh, well-known dinosaur species through a similar kind of format where there were uh, practical experiments uh, interspersed with CGI um, segments. Um, so, yeah, I, I wonder if it's um, the overall format is going to be something similar to that. And, you know, but bonus points, it's, it was also presented by a comedic uh, British uh, uh, presenter. So, um, yeah, I, 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 was, I was actually more reminded of that than of things like, say, um, Walking with Dinosaurs or, or Prehistoric Planet. I think it's going to be a very different kind of show. But, um yeah, so I, I would say it there, there are definitely things about it that pique my interest, but also um, uh, it, it also does feel like a bit a bit standard fare. It, like um, it does remind me a lot, like you said, of sort of early to mid 2000s paleo documentaries. Um, so I am curious to, to see how um, how accurate that impression turns out to be. Oh, yeah. Like I, I, I definitely want to know, like, what the topics are going to be mm -hmm. like is this going to be just dinosaurs 101 again right or are we going to get some like new research that will be featured that is really talked about in popular culture um but uh, i do i will admit i, I do kind of like the idea of the format mm -hmm. um like having kind of like a non-researcher but somebody who is nonetheless very interested in the field come in mm -hmm. in this case a, a british comedian yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Because it, it really reminds me of another older documentary series that I quite enjoyed by the late Terry Jones um, called Medieval Lives, where th this was a multi-episode series, but uh, he picked like a different trope of like medieval Europe, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, the maiden, the knight, the, the alchemist. And he kind of breaks down misconceptions and talks about like genuine scholarship in uh, post-classical studies um and you know he he had all the enthusiasm that you could want with a show like that so i certainly think that stephen fry's charm and i know he's worked with dinosaurs before mm -hmm. because um i i remember when i first got my ipad many years ago he narrated a dinosaur app mm. that you could buy it was one of the first apps i had ever bought um and that's that's where I learned about the perforated acetabulum, ah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the feature of dinosaurs, you know, hole in the hip for the legs. Um, but uh, so it's like he clearly has a um, 
you know, a vested interest and in, he, he loves dinosaurs. And so he's going to just have like infectious enthusiasm throughout this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. I think that'll probably be one of the saving graces for this mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if nothing else. But I mean, I, I will certainly reserve my judgment. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Obviously like, this is not going to air in the States for me, but I'll, I'll probably find some way to watch it anyway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and w we will certainly share our thoughts, uh, you know, in time. Um, I have not been able to find a release date for this, but they're saying it's this year. Um, yeah, that's do right. you happen to know anything about that by chance? Uh, no, not not beyond that. I I didn't. I wasn't able to find, or or at least I, I didn't see a um, an exact release date. But yeah, later this year apparently, uh, which uh, presumably means it should be coming out soon. Oh yeah, I mean it's not like we got. <laughs> I mean we got half of October and then right. November, December. So it's like, hmm. but uh. Yeah, I mean, hey, new paleo media, even if it's of fairly decent quality, is always welcome mm. in my book. Yeah. Mm. Um, we could certainly use more of that. Um, but hey, so why don't we why don't we jump into our news stories? Yeah, sounds um, good. So same fair as the last episode where we did this. Each of us picked one story per month. So Albert and I, we have an August story and we have a September story so to kind of cover the time frame that we missed. So... For our first story, this is for August. Um, if we go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get into the specifics of the story itself, um, I think it's appropriate that we introduce some of the animals that are featured in the story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we haven't really had much chance to talk about early vertebrates on our show. Um, we had one story from our March 2021 news episode about stem lampreys. Mm -hmm. And we had another one from June 2021 about a new placoderm that was found to be very closely related to the living jawless fishes. Jawed the fish. living jawed fishes, yeah. mm -hmm. excuse me. <laughs> um, however, uh, the majority of the early vertebrates featured in this study, and we could arguably all you know, call them all fishes, um, mm -hmm. we haven't really talked about them or introduced them. So if you're roughly familiar with paleontology, you may be aware that there were several varieties of jawless fishes that existed during the early periods of the Paleozoic era, which subsequently gave rise to jawed fishes via a process that we still don't really fully understand. Mm -hmm. um, historically, these species have been referred to as agnethans, and they include the ancestors of the living hagfishes and lampreys, you know, both being eel-like, tubular-mouthed predators that are usually classified together as cyclostomes though i i believe this is not like full consensus yet um, yeah it was a uh, it was controversial for definitely a while but I, I would say it's the mainstream kind of view nowadays um and in fact i, I think in the lampreys episode we, we might have talked a bit about the the whole cyclostome controversy um but yeah i think um i, I would say that even though there there might still be some holdouts uh it's more or less widely accepted now. Okay. Yeah, I would have to go back and, and check that episode again for sure. <laughs> it's funny, we're at, we're at a point now in the show where we have such a huge backlog right. of, of stories. It's like, I have to remember, did we talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, there you go, cyclostomes. Um, but yeah, so that lineage diverged very early on. And in the phylogeny on the right here, that uppermost branch uh, constitutes that group. Um, and they diverged, you know, during the, the Cambrian period, at least late in the Cambrian period. Um, but of course, later groups developed into a myriad variety of body plans with uh, asymmetrical tails, uh, paired pectoral fins, and dorsal fins, and in many cases, full body armor. Now, the lattermost feature, which is seen in groups like the Osteostracans, uh, and I have an example of one here in the center left. This is Trematespis, um, and the uh, Teraspidomorphs. Now, these were no doubt adaptations to living in a world with much larger invertebrate predators. And then later on, of course, larger armored fishes as well. Um, now, the armor protected all of the vital organs, including those in the head. And it's because of this tough exterior that we've been able to find so many fossils from these guys. Um, now, there were other groups of jawless fishes that were not armored, um, and these include the thelodonts. Mm -hmm. And so we have one uh, on the top left here, this is a fur cacata, um, and then the anaspids. And these were covered in scales throughout the body. And some of these had very large fins, as you can certainly see from the image here. Now, according to 
phylogenies like this one, uh, the ancestors of the jawed fishes would have been most closely related to the osteostracans. And it's here where the placoderms enter. Uh, now, of course, you may recall from our earlier news episode about uh, placoderms, um, and many of these, of course, would have been armored as well. Uh, these are not a natural group by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they form a sequence of lineages that lead up to the crown group of jawed vertebrates, um, which, of course, are the chondrichthians, the, uh, the sharks and the rays in their kind, and the ostichthians, which are the, the bony fishes. Including us. That's right. Because, of, I mean, what are we but fishes with a you know a couple tweaks here and there <laughs> pretty much <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump to the next slide now that we have our kind of foundations in place so uh in the past uh, by seeing all these different lineages of fishes over time paleontologists had developed the new head hypothesis now the premise is as follows uh, following their descent from kind of wormy lancelet like ancestors um, the earliest fishes developed their head ends into an important sensory organ that played a key role in the direction of movement. Now, as these early jawless fishes evolved, there was a trend from slow-moving, bottom-dwelling forms towards more active species with pronounced fins that were able to finally enter the more pelagic areas of the ocean, or becoming nectonic as the technical term. With the advent of jaws, these active fishes became more and more predatory, giving rise to the modern lineages we see today. On the surface, this made sense, but ultimately it was never a hypothesis that was really tested before. And a big problem was that we knew very little about the anatomy, behavior, and ecology of these early jawless fishes and placoderms. We had to rely mainly on comparisons with living species, which is itself problematic because, you know, there are no living analogs to something like an uh, osteostracan. And so this is where uh, Humberto G. Ferron and Philip C.J. Donahue came in. They knew from previous studies that the caudal fin anatomy of fishes, and that is the tail fin of a fish, could accurately predict the swimming speed of a fish independent of other aspects of anatomy. And we at least have many relatively complete fossils of these early fishes to know what their caudal fins looked like. So it was up to the duo to simply extend that previous work into the paleontological realm to test for themselves whether the new head hypothesis had any merit. They measured the body size and caudal fin morphology of 45 genera of ancient fish taxa spanning from the late Ordovician to the early Permian period in comparison with 61 living fish species and modeled these via a phylogenetically informed regression, which combines all the measurements together to predict swimming speed. And you've already seen the phylogeny they use on the previous slide. So if you need a refresher, feel free to pause and go back. But basically they sampled early cyclostomes, all four of the now extinct jawless fish lineages, and a range of placoderm groups, including antiarchs and uh, pedalicthids and uh, arthrodires. Now, morphometrics were used to reconstruct the life appearance of the extinct fishes, considering 102 landmarks of the caudal fin and uh, ventral regions of the body, which were then digitized and tested to account for both swimming speeds based on equally scaled up caudal fin shapes and size accurate caudal fin shapes, you know, just to make sure. And essentially what they found challenged the new head hypothesis. Rather than being a simple progression from slow bottom dwellers to active open ocean cruisers, it was found that ancestral swimming speeds were highly divergent across many of these early fish lineages. While this had been argued before, the study showed that both the anaspids and the thelodonts retained the fastest and most active swimming speeds out of all the sample, while the armored lineages like the osteostracans and the placoderms tended to be on the slower side of things mm. with the lowest swimming speeds. Now this is notable because many of the placoderms being jawed fishes were supposed to be the most active moving predators in the new head model. Mm. But with forms like the antiarchs representing some of the earliest jawed vertebrates, that doesn't seem very likely anymore. 
Now that the anaspids and the thelodonts, and the paper uses the term microsquamous, mm -hmm. uh, which means that basically their bodies are covered with tiny scales. Um, these were the fastest and most active swimmers. And because they evolved in the late Ordovician and the early Silurian, that means that we might have to tweak our understanding of the Nectonic Revolution. Uh, and this was supposed to have described an event that took place in the Devonian period, whereby marine organisms of many types started colonizing the higher levels of the water column to become free swimming forms. Now, of course, there's certainly many other implications for this research. Um, if the armored jawless fishes and the placoderms were not very active swimmers, then it stands to reason that this may have limited their distribution in the past mm -hmm. to the continental shelves and encouraged unique evolutionary endemism like we see in shelf living organisms today. Uh, the more active jawless fishes, like the thelodonts, for example, these may have been capable of crossing oceans and maybe engaging in migratory events, again, like many fish do today. So clearly the early Paleozoic world of fishes was perhaps as complex and diverse as the Cenozoic world of fishes that even today still has many mysteries. Mm. So uh, I thought this was a fantastic study. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the kind of origin of jaws is such a, you know, one of the major outstanding mysteries regarding um, vertebrate evolution. And um, it's always fantastic to see new research on, on the subject, and especially one that kind of also gives us insight into how these ancient fishes lived. Um, that's not, not necessarily something you see uh, very often. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool that they were able to uh, not only uh, provide some data on the swimming abilities of these fishes, but also use that as a way to test ideas of jaw evolution. Like those are concepts that many people might not necessarily like think to to link together. And uh, yeah, I agree. This is a this is a really fascinating study. Yeah, I like the aspect that this research has been done before on living forms as a way to test certain models of of locomotion. And like them being able to get successful results with that and then extend that into like paleontology. Um, I, I appreciate when stuff like that happens mm -hmm. because it kind of gives a little bit more confidence in these results. So uh, hopefully we can see kind of more of this with other lesser known groups. Mm -hmm. um, certainly. Now, um, speaking of slow moving swimmers, <laughs> uh, I believe our next. Uh, August paper, uh, which is your study, yeah. kind of covers a group like that. <laughs> Am I correct in saying? You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, so let's, uh, let's head on over to my first story. Um, so yes, um, that, that is an interesting link. That definitely was not intended, but um, <laughs> you're right, uh, because this next story is about another group of um, slow-swimming aquatic animals, and uh, these are not uh, fish grade vertebrates, even though, you know, phylogenetically you could think of them as fishes, uh, but instead they are a group of aquatic mammals called the sea cows or sirenians. Um, and even if you haven't heard of the name sirenian before, you might be familiar with the members of this group. Um, you might have heard of them. Uh, they include the manatees and the dugons. And so these are one of the few groups of mammals to be completely aquatic. Um, that is, they pretty much never venture out onto land. In fact, if they, if they did, they would probably put themselves at severe risk because they would have trouble kind of moving around once they were beached on land. Um, now, I, I do know that there, there are instances, and, and there is film of this, you can look it up, where people have seen manatees that kind of sort of haul themselves up a little bit on the edge of a riverbank to the feet on grass or other plants that's growing on the side of the the, uh, the water but you know that that, that barely counts as, as coming onto land um <laughs> like uh, by and large these are completely aquatic mammals and of course the other major group of completely aquatic mammals are the whales but sea cows and whales are not closely related in fact, it's kind of ironic because whales are more closely related to cows than the sea cows are <laughs> it's <laughs> that's kind of funny um and uh, in fact, they have very different types of lifestyles. 
um, whales are pretty much all carnivorous uh, predators. Like even you know a baleen whale that eats very 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 small prey is still feeding on other animals um, like krill um, and other planktonic forms, but. Uh, sea cows instead are pretty much entirely herbivorous and they feed on things like sea grasses, uh, which is why they're mostly confined to relatively coastal regions um, as well as in fresh water. So they can they can live in both fresh and salt water. I, I have heard that occasionally, you know, they, they might scavenge a fish that's been caught in a net or something. Uh, that's something that happens, but a lot of so-called herbivorous animals do that. They a bit of protein to supplement their diet but you know if you look at their adaptations and the proportions of uh, what their diets consist of uh, they are essentially herbivorous animals um, mostly feeding on plants so if uh, sea cows are not that close to cows or to whales um, what are they closely related to well, uh, this is another interesting aspect of their biology. Um, so they belong to a rather strange assemblage of mammals called the Afrotheres. Um, and the Afrotheres include, most famously perhaps, the elephants, um, but also a variety of other forms that might uh, you know, look quite different. Um, so they also include a group of um, smaller mammals uh, from Africa and the Middle East called the Hyraxes, uh, which get to about the size of a rabbit. They're very curious creatures. Um, they don't have um, uh, well-developed claws for most part, but they're very good climbers despite that. They can climb trees and up sheer rock uh, surfaces uh, because of the pads on their feet, which is really interesting. So they like to live in rocky areas or in trees. Um, and even though they don't look very much like it, they are closely related to the elephants and sea cows. Um, and in, in addition to those three groups, um, there is a whole host of afrotheres that form a kind of insectivorous clades, a primarily um, insect-eating lineage. Uh, most famously, this includes the aardvark, which is a, the largest uh, primarily ant-eating mammal um, that is around today, uh, another very unusual species. And then a huge array of much smaller insectivores. So these include things like the tenrix of Madagascar, which come in just a staggering array of, of morphologies. Um, there are some that look like hedgehogs, some that look like shrews, some that look like moles, and yet they are not closely related to any of those um, insect-eating mammals from other parts of the world. Um, instead, they are more closely related to the elephants and sea cows and hyraxes and aardvarks. Um, and uh, on uh, continental Africa, um, you have things like the Sengis or elephant shrews, um, which when they were first called elephant shrews, no one actually expected they would be closely related to elephants, but it turns out they are um, uh, quite, quite the ir irony. Um, and also a group called the golden moles, uh, which are not closely related to the true moles. Um, so really, really interesting creatures all around. Like, like I, I feel like every single one of these uh, groups of Afrotheres would probably rank pretty high among my favorite mammal groups because they, they are so um, interesting um, and distinctive. Um, and yet they all form this big lineage of mammals called Afrotheria. And the reason it's called Afrotheria is because uh, we think that this group probably originated in Africa. Um, and indeed, most of its members still uh, kind of are primarily African today. Now with the sea cows, of course, they have kind of achieved uh, distribution outside of Africa. So uh, the living species of sea cows are the three species of manatee, and one of them does live in Africa, but there's also one from South America, and one from uh, essentially North and Central America, and also kind of the northeastern edge of South America. So it kind of has a, a center of distribution in the in the tropical Americas, um, on around the Caribbean Ocean. So that's a West Indian manatee, um, and then there's the uh, dugong, um, which lives in the Indo-Pacific region, like pretty much all around the coast. There, uh, dugongs um, kind of can be found. And finally, um, even though these are the four living species, uh, up until very recently, we actually had a fifth living sea cow, um, and it was a close relative of the dugon. So this would have been stellar sea cow, which lived up in the North Pacific, and so it would have been the only um, modern sea cow to be adapted to cold 
ocean waters. And it also got much bigger than the others. You can see that on the illustration here. Um, in fact, I think they could get to about like nine meters long, something like that, uh, in contrast to the others, which are about two or three meters long. Um, so it was a huge animal. But um, very tragically is that shortly after they were discovered by um, European explorers, um, and I mean very quickly, within less than 30 years of their discovery, they were hunted to extinction because they were, you know, slow-moving swimmers, like you, like you said earlier. Um, and they were big and had a lot of meat and fat on them and easy to hunt. So, yeah, uh, they were very quickly kind of hunted to complete extinction. And that happened in the um, 18th century. The uh, stellar sea cow and the dugong differ from the manatees in uh, a number of ways, but probably the most obvious one um, is the shape of their tail. And you can see that on the illustration here. The dugong and the stellar sea cow had a sort of more, uh, you could say a whale-like tail, where there are two lobes coming off of the, the tail. And so they use that as their primary propulsive organ uh, when they're swimming through the water. Now, the manatees, of course, uh, also use a tail as a propulsive organ, but their tail shape is more paddle-like. As you can see, it's more rounded. So uh, that's kind of the most obvious um, external difference between these two separate lineages. So yeah, these are the two living uh, sea cow lineages. There aren't many species, but they're very widely distributed. Uh, so we have the manatees, and then we have the, the dugongs. And in a, in a broad sense, that would also include the Stellar's sea cow. So OK, that's pretty neat. Um, and because there have been so few species, uh, we have a pretty decent handle on their um, phylogeny, their, how, how they're related to each other um, through um, genetics and um, anatomy. But uh, the thing is, uh, there haven't always been only five species of sea cows. In fact, sea cows have a very extensive uh, fossil record um, going far back in time to near the beginning of the Cenozoic era. And probably because being relatively large aquatic animals, they have rather dense bones and are quite easy to preserve. So there is a, there, there's a very extensive uh, record of their fossils. Um, and so um, the authors of this new paper, Heritage and Seifert, um, decided to try and bring all this, these different types of data to try and shed light on um, how modern sea cows originated and what their evolutionary history was like. And so they took genetic um, data from all the living um, species of sea cow, as well as the recently extinct stellar sea cow, um, as well as um, anatomical features, so morphological features from both living and extinct uh, fossil sea cows. Um, not only that, but they also included um, the ages of the fossils in their analyses. And so combining all these different lines of evidence, um, they kind of analyzed the, all this data together to try and reconstruct a phylogeny of sea cows that includes both the living and fossil forms and can um, be dated accurately or hopefully and well that is to say we can um, in, a, in a way that we can place dates on the divergence times of these different lineages and after that uh, once they had their tree they all were also able to map out um, yeah, yeah, that was not an intentional pun, but they were able to map out the uh, geographic distribution um, of these different species. Um, they kind of matched up the, the geographic distribution of these species onto the tree to try and reconstruct where the common ancestors of these lineages might have lived. And we've spoken of before in my Dinosaurs a Second Chapter series that if you only look at the distributions of modern um, you know, species, you can sometimes get very misleading ideas about their geographic history. So this is where fossils are very important um, because they can show you um, that certain lineages might have lived in places they um, once upon a time, but don't anymore. And that could completely change the way we think um, uh, about how and you know, where they evolved. So uh, they combine all these different lines of evidence to try and give us the uh, most complete look at the um, uh, evolution of sea cows that we have gone so far. And th this is the kind of study that I, that I really kind of gravitate towards because, well, I mean, <laughs> this is basically the kind of research that I do, except I do it with birds. But uh, yeah, if you're, if you're familiar at all with um, the research that I do, the, this, is, this is basically it. Like I, uh, I look at genetic material from, from living species and combine that with anatomical data from both the living and extinct species, um, and also take into account uh, fossil ages and geography and things to try, try and reconstruct out of these uh, broad scale 
evolutionary patterns and histories. Um, so uh, I'm always like, you know, pretty interested when I see a study on this done um, on pretty much any group of animals, not, not just birds. Um, and so it's really wonderful to see uh, this being done on such an interesting group of mammals here. Um, and indeed, it turns out that sea cows seem to have had a very complex geographic history. Uh, so first of all, they were able to um, confirm or at least support the idea that like other Afrothiers, the sea cows probably originated in Africa. Um, and in fact, they originated quite early in the uh, Cenozoic during the late Paleocene, which is the first epoch of the uh, Cenozoic. Um, and more specifically, they probably originated in North Africa. And that's indeed where the oldest fossils of you know, the total group sea cows have been found. Um, and in fact, some of these early fossils are of sea cows that could still go on land potentially. So they had four limbs instead of just, just two like they now have today. So that's certainly consistent with what we saw bef um, thought before. And then um, they found that uh, there was a um, immense array of what we would call stem um, sea cows. So these would be members of the sea cow lineage, but not members of the modern group of sea cows. So they wouldn't have been nested within uh, these living species pictured here. Um, and uh, from North Africa, as you might imagine, they could pretty easily get to Europe. So the diversity of um, early uh, stem sea cows in Europe um, was quite high. But eventually, um, it seems that the, uh, uh, the modern group of sea cows, the crown group Cyrenians, um, probably descended from ancestors that eventually left Europe um, and actually crossed over the Atlantic into the Western Atlantic slash Caribbean region. Um, they, in fact, kind of suggest it was it would have been somewhere around the present day position of the Bahamas, uh, where the modern group of sea cows originated um, around the Eocene Oligocene boundary, which is interesting because this was the time when a lot of climatic changes were happening um, there. Like overall, the Earth was getting getting cooler. Um, there were probably various changes in the uh, kind of extent of different types of environments around the world. Um, and uh, it seems that a lot of the stem sea cows that used to be very diverse um, along, you know, in, in Europe, a lot of these stem sea cows, they probably went extinct in great numbers around this time. And so after the Eocene Oligocene boundary, um, and more specifically after the Oligocene, uh, it was pretty much just the modern group of sea cows left. But um, that doesn't mean that it was just these five species, and indeed uh, these, these five species probably had not uh, specifically ha had not originated yet. Um, the modern group of sea cows um, still uh, had a lot of diversification that happened after this point, leading up to many different um, other lineages that are now extinct. So then we can take a look at the, end of the two individual uh, lineages of the modern sea cow group. So uh, because they, they, have, uh, they appear to have had very different histories. Um, so the manatees, um, what happened after uh, they kind of diverged from the dugongs in the, at the Eocene Oligocene boundary in the Caribbean region? Well, um, it turns out we don't have a very good manatee fossil record. Um, so there's a sort of gap in, in the Oligocene um, where we're not exactly sure uh, what was going on with the manatee lineage. But uh, we do have the earliest fossil manatees um, in the Miocene, um, and those were found in South America. And indeed, um, pretty much all manatee fossils until relatively recent in geologic time were found in South America. So it seems that the modern group of manatees um, was um, originated in South America. It was probably confined there for most of their history until eventually the Amazon River system um, started to discharge into the Atlantic Ocean. And that was probably when they were able to kind of exit uh, South America um, and kind of spread out to their current modern day distributions. Um, so we now have the West Indian manatee um, in the sort of Caribbean um, coastal regions, um, as well as going up into freshwater regions. And uh, the um, African manatee, which uh, appears to have gone back across the Atlantic and then colonized uh, the West African um, coast, as well as some of the river systems there as well. Um, so that's a very curious kind of thing, because uh, if you 
if you had a very, you know, uh, what we would say, a uh, rather naive view, you might think that, oh, well, you know, apathies originated in Africa, so the African manatee was probably there all along, or at least, like, the, its ancestors were. But no, actually, it seems that uh, it's a second kind of recolonization of Africa from elsewhere. So that's, a, that's pretty interesting. Um, meanwhile, the dugong lineage, including both the uh, ancestors of the stellar sea cow and the dugong, um, appear to have made several independent dispersals um, into the Pacific region. Because remember, the stellar sea cow um, lived in the North Pacific, and the dugong currently lives in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and in fact, uh, in this uh, study, they found that um, the dugong lineage actually had a lot of extinct groups um, that not only made this journey, but also dispersed back across the Atlantic, much like a manatee did, except none of the Atlantic um, uh, dugong lineages have survived to present day. But uh, yeah, the, uh, so the stellar sea cow lineage, uh, we know, um, has a, actually has a pretty extensive fossil record um, from the uh, early Miocene onwards. So there are a lot of fossils of um, early relatives of the uh, stellar sea cow uh, along the western North American um, coast. Uh, and so from there, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty reasonable to infer that over time, um, the stellar sea cow lineage traveled up to the North Pacific and gained adaptations for a cold water kind of um, environment. Meanwhile, the dugong is a, is a bit more of a mystery. There, there isn't so much of a fossil record detailing kind of its evolutionary history of dispersal. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very strange that um, even though it seems that modern um, sea cows, a modern sea cow group originated in the Caribbean region, uh, yet we have the dugong out here in the Indo-Pacific. So how did they get there? Uh, of course, there are a few different alternative routes they might have taken. Um, but the authors favor the idea that they probably crossed over the, to the Pacific prior to the formation of the Isthmus of Panama. So uh, probably sometime before the Pliocene, so maybe late, late, late Miocene, early Pliocene kind of times. Uh, so, yeah, that, that might have been how, how the dugong got to the Indo-Pacific, uh, because the alternatives would have been to, say, travel um, uh, down around Africa and, and across the Atlantic first, uh, which seems less likely, because that way they would have had to cross uh, colder waters, um, and there, there is no evidence that the uh, dugong, the modern dugong species, uh, was ever a cold water dweller, and most uh, sea cows aren't. Um, the stellar sea cow is kind of unusual in that regard. Um, and in addition, the uh, ocean currents um, themselves would have favored a more uh, westward dispersal uh, instead of going going back across the Atlantic and then around Africa into the Indo-Pacific. Um, and not only that, but the um, uh, genetic information from modern dugong populations also suggests that sort of like um, the earliest splits in modern dugong um, divergences um, happened um, closer to you know the the Australasian uh, kind of Pacific region and not not so much on the uh, western side of the Indian Ocean. So uh, yeah, the it it seems that the dugong actually uh, crossed the Pacific to get to its current um, distribution, which is a uh, quite the journey. Um, and you might wonder, well, these are um, aquatic mammals, right? Why, why don't they just, you know, go go anywhere they want? They, they are kind of confined to various regions um, uh, in the modern day. And uh, yeah, it seems that uh, sea cows probably don't make like open ocean crossings very often. And that is, as we alluded to earlier, precisely because of their diet, because they feed on um, uh, coastal water plants. Um, and so they pretty much only stick to the coasts uh, most of the time. And in addition, most of them, other than the stellar sea cow, um, are not very cold tolerant, so they mostly stick to the tropics. And so in the modern day, uh, it might be pretty difficult for them to kind of cross uh, wide stretches of open ocean. And it, it may well have been difficult for them even back then, too, um, in their evolutionary history. But it's one of those things where if you give it long enough time, uh, unlikely events can happen. And so there could have been a few freak occurrences that allowed certain sea cows to make it across um, large stretches of ocean, which then led to um, their current day distributions. So yeah, that was a pretty detailed look at sea cow origins. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm always interested in this kind of study. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I really agree. Um... 
I definitely tend to gravitate to a lot of these studies too. Um, it's really fascinating. It, it reminds me a lot of an old Tet Zoo article. Hmm. Yes, um, that's right. <laughs> the, the version one days. Yeah. Um, and I think that one was only about manatees. Right. And uh, they pretty much did kind of make the case that this study did that, mm -hmm. like, at least for the manatee story, it was a, a, a west to east kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Because I guess that there had been some prior work that talked about, oh, well, you know, there's these currents in the Atlantic, so they probably came from Africa to right. South America, but uh, clearly like that, that, that does not follow through. Um, wow, that's really neat. Um, part of me is wondering now, because the stellar sea cow mm -hmm. was yeah definitely a very tragic story um you know being a a, a cold tolerant serenian mm -hmm. i wonder if that has to do with like its body size i mean yeah i i would imagine that had a big part to, to, to do with it yeah because <laughs> like arctic whales are all fairly big animals that's right uh, yeah. i can't recall like dolphins or porpoises yeah i mean we have like that. Belugas and narwhals are probably some of the smaller ones, but yeah, like even they are still larger than a, than a lot of porpoises and dolphins are. Right, like I think belugas are about like five meters. Yeah, which is yeah, that, that's pretty significant. Right, but right. you're right; they are definitely on the smaller end. Um, yeah, and like I, I am definitely curious about like the stellar's history as well, because as as I understand it, they were probably not very common. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, given, given like their historic distribution, at least their recorded historic distribution, um, I, I, I do uh, I do understand like they did have a wider range in mm -hmm. the past, but they were probably not like super plentiful. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but they were you know they were still like herding animals like you know manatees and dugongs today. Um, I, I have like childhood memories of manatees because yeah. we still live in Florida for a while. Right. And uh, that's like one of the regions where like the West Indian manatee mm -hmm. tends to frequent. Um, like, in fact, I think the, the the like Florida manatee is like a subspecies mm -hmm. of that yeah. of that group. So it's like a specific thing. But yeah, we would see them. Um, like we would see like their backs and maybe like the tops of their heads, like in certain coastal areas that we would visit. And um, they always seemed just like one of the chillest animals. <laughs> like in the world um they're like like they're like capybaras yeah yeah <laughs> you, you never see one like pissed off yeah or like really like energetic and crazy right right just kind of doing their own thing they're very and chill it's, yeah <laughs> it's funny to think about how they've probably been like this for like their entire history right right um, yeah <laughs> just gregarious cozy animals mm -hmm. <laughs> probably a lot of uh internal bonding among social right. groups because I, I i read about like the accounts of, of of the of like europeans who saw the stellar sea mm -hmm. cow and I, I was always struck by how like whenever they would you know kill and bring up a a, a sea cow um all the others would just like come up to oh, it yeah, to like check right. things out and like try to nudge the body and like they would come back for days afterward to that exact same spot and it's like, damn, you mm -hmm. know, like that, that is like, the, that's that aspect of extinction that always gets to you. Yeah. Um, like how the animals themselves are probably processing everything. But, um, no, this is a very fascinating study. And I, I'm glad that we're at this point now with the Serenian fossil record that we can flesh out so many of these details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm definitely very curious about the, the Amazon part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a, a refugia for manatees until conditions changed and they were able to kind of spread out right because yeah the amazon is not really a region in paleontology you hear about all that much mm -hmm. yep mm -hmm. like the most that you'll hear is like oh like it, the rainforest kind of came and gone several times and there was lots of flooding that was going on mm -hmm. there but in terms of like actual faunas or like localities those are usually very obscure yeah yeah because uh, yeah rainforests don't preserve fossils very well so yeah they're, which is a shame because obviously they're some of the most biodiverse regions on earth and so uh yeah uh, you think about what we're missing and it's uh it's quite sobering <laughs> exactly it's like it's a parallel thing in anthropology too mm -hmm. it's just amazon very underutilized yeah. but in popular culture and like in popular texts but like 
there was so much stuff going on down there research wise mm-hmm. that um, there's a whole story that we could we could certainly tell dedicate a whole episode to if we wanted. Um, but that's excellent. So, all right. Uh, now we're going to move on to our September stories. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, I am off again. Um, my September news story is also a bit of a follow up to a story that I had covered during our July 2021 episode. And some of you might remember this. Um, this was Southern Desner and Pika et al.'s um, paper describing two encounters between chimpanzees and gorillas mm. in the Loango National Park in Gabon, where the chimps actually attacked and killed young gorillas in both instances. And we had discussed how, even with the understanding that the two great apes share a distribution across Western and Central Africa, you very rarely hear about interactions between them. Mm -hmm. Sure, these have been documented, but they're very few and far between and have left many questions for us. Specifically, do these interactions play any role in the life histories of either species? Multi-species primate communities have certainly been extensively studied, um, and they've revealed fascinating behaviors. I mean, one that always comes to my mind is where there are many regions where several groups of monkeys will coexist Mm. and share alarm calls that warn others of predators. Um, But we've really kind of lacked any sort of study like that between chimpanzees and gorillas. And so Croquette Amsans and colleagues have taken the initiative and for the first time combined many years of research and observation on these apes to provide a more comprehensive account of their social interactions. Now, in total, they have found 33 publications regarding sympatry, or instances of coexistence between species in an area, uh, and also went out and performed their own field work on these apes. And this is at the uh, Gualugo Triangle in the Republic of Congo. So they have added a further 285 observations Mm -hmm. taken between 1999 and 2020. And so we certainly have much better data now. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of trends did they find? Now, as alluded to in that earlier episode, many of the instances of interaction between gorillas and chimps were peaceful affairs. The two will feed on fruits and leaves from the same trees and nest in the general vicinity, although not together because you both have different preferences for nesting. Um, But the team did find evidence of play between the young of both species. And uh, one instance of interspecific sexual interaction between the young of two species, which that was very surprising to me. Um, There were several instances of affiliation where gorillas would follow the sounds of chimpanzee vocalizations towards sources of food and instances of chimpanzees actually using chest beating, which is something that only gorillas are supposed to do. Um, now, sometimes gorillas would leave their groups and join chimps on foraging parties. Um, and we even had cases where one species emitted predation alarm calls that the other responded to, hmm. causing members of both groups to kind of get up on higher alert and scout the area. Now, of course, there were also agonistic behaviors. Hmm. Um, of course, we need not mention again the instances of chimps killing the young gorillas, but the team did find evidence also of possible mitigation of threats between both species hmm. like there was one instance of attempted play between a young gorilla and a group of chimps that was thwarted when the mother gorilla came and took the baby away hmm. now besides none of the agonific agonistic encounters that the team recorded had ever really escalated to that level of lethal violence hmm. and i think that's pretty notable um now that's not to say that all of these interactions were like wholly beneficial Um, Another kind of negative aspect that the team found was disease transmission. Mm. Turned out to be a very common risk because gorillas would like feed on fruits that were already chewed on by chimps and like would feed in areas where chimps relieved themselves. Mm. And so like, that's not bueno. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Now this study more than ever before has fleshed out our understanding of gorilla and chimpanzee sympatry. And I think that alone is admirable. 
But the team also wanted to test some cost-benefit analyses to see whether the interactions between the two species in any way shape their life histories and their social relationships in really important ways. And right away, the team noted that their observations of sympatry supported anti-predation models, mm. whereby the two species increased their chances of stopping predators from attacking them by essentially associating together hmm. or working together. Um, and they were also able to reject food competition models. So there was no evidence of any intolerance or disassociation between the ape species when feeding together. And they were comfortable eating from the same types of plants and never really kind of partitioned themselves in any way. Or were like arguing over, oh, this is my tree. This is my tree. <laughs> like they just kind of ate together. Hmm. Now, however, there were also some interesting notes. Now, one model for sympatry between organisms is that differences in body size play a role in species coexistence. So like smaller animals will stay close to larger animals for protection. And of course, um, uh, chimpanzees in general are much smaller than gorillas. Mm -hmm. But the team found no evidence of that in any of the interactions between these two species. Instead, the apes were existing in a shared social network. Uh, now, another interesting note, uh, the bouts of play between the young of both species were particularly intriguing because the age range of these interactions drops once the individuals pass their subadult stages. Uh, further interactions between the apes in their adult lives were mostly confined to quote unquote core areas of residence, while it was in the peripheries of these groups uh, that conflicts would tend to occur. Hmm. So individuals would actually actively avoid those areas and instead go to the core areas to interact with the groups. Now, that's kind of weird. Like, what does that mean? You know, does this shift from childhood play to kind of a mutual tolerance except on the borders of territories mean anything? Um, now this is kind of where the study falls short, but you know, further research is now in place to kind of investigate this. Um, but based on everything that we have here, it is becoming more certain that the sympatry between gorillas and chimpanzees probably has contributed to their social and cultural evolution. And this is curious because, you know, these lineages separated between about 12 to 9 million years ago. Hmm. And one wonders just how these lines split in the first place if associative behaviors like these were occurring in the deep past. So like if these, if these, if these two primates were essentially coexisting together in many ways, you know, what, then what factors were there to kind of split them up mm -hmm. into like their own lineages and become so distinct from each other. Yeah. Mm. And of course, naturally studies like this, can help illuminate our own origins and evolution. Because um, it is now textbook knowledge that hominins coexisted with each other throughout the past several million years. And, you know, this sympatry was just as likely to have played a role in shaping our social and cultural evolution too, right. as much as it might have been doing for the living great apes. So, you know, did the young of Paranthropus boisei and Homo habilis play with each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did groups of Paranthropus afarensis follow foraging parties of Kenyanthropus platyops around? Uh, did Homo ergaster engage agonistically with Paranthropus robustus, killing the young, as we mentioned in the earlier study? Um, I think all of this and more is very possible. And even if we're not lucky to be able to find any concrete evidence of this, mm -hmm. Our knowledge of the interactions between chimps and gorillas in this context makes them all the more likely. And so I am definitely very curious to see more observations and study like this, especially in like other regions of Africa too, um, like especially in the Western parts. And like, for example, where the, um, the ranges of the, uh, the mountain gorillas coexist with chimpanzees mm. too. And like, you know, what's going on with bonobos too? Cause, uh, this is only the, the common chimpanzee, uh, Pantroglodytes, that is the focus mm -hmm. of this paper. I, I couldn't find anything on bonobos, so it's like, hmm, what's going on yeah. with them? Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a much more tolerant species of outsiders. Right. Considering that, and considering that what we're seeing here where the chimps and grills aren't really like 
engaging very much in agonistic behaviors. So like there's probably a lot more going on between them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'd love to see more of that. Um, what about you, Albert? What do you think? Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with that. Um, and yeah, first of all, I guess I, I'll say it's, it's always fun when we get to do a follow up to a study that we've talked about before. So uh, <laughs> yeah, because it, it really shows that you know, science is, is a process like it, it's not just it, no single study is like the end of the discussion. Uh, there's always more to discover. And so it, it's really cool to, to get uh, this new data coming in. And um, yeah, I guess uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that the interactions between chimps and gorillas are so complex and varied because, of course, they, you know, they, they are both highly intelligent animals um, with uh, some similarities, but also a lot of differences uh, living in the same environments, um, at least in many cases. So, uh, yeah, I, I can I can certainly imagine that there would be a lot of very different types of um, interactions that could unfold between them. Uh, but the fact that, you know, these um, interactions have actually been observed and documented, I, I think is really valuable um, to our understanding of them. And I, yeah, I, I also like the sort of um, the fact that they were able to analyze um, these observations for patterns to try and, you know, find like uh, consistent um, interactions among individuals across specific contexts. Um, I think that's a really interesting uh, point to, you know, uh, to investigate too, um, and like you, yeah, I, I wonder what what this means for our you know uh, stem human ancestors and relatives, because clearly a lot of them were were St. Patrick and uh, almost certainly would have interacted with each other in some way. Um, so yeah, I wonder. I wonder. I would be really curious to know what, um, what what happened between them. It's a uh, it's super interesting. So no, uh, yeah, this is a. This is a great follow-up to, to that previous study, um, and it is good to know that they're they're not always killing each other or anything. Not not that it, you know we we expect that, but um, uh, it definitely paints a very complex picture, and uh, you know that that's always that's always fun. <laughs> Absolutely, I think my favorite observations have to be like the instances of play. Yes, <laughs> the younger two because they record all kinds of stuff, like you know play wrestling and tussling around and you know, like picking up sticks and stuff. Um, because like in those instances, like I mean, they're just kids. Yeah. It's like they're not gonna have. I mean, they're probably not going to have like the complex, you know, map of social interactions mm -hmm. and their history like the adults would. Right. Um. I mean, they're just they're just kind of babies. They're just kind of, you know, living life to the fullest, so to speak. <laughs> um, which really makes me curious about like other instances. Like, do we have like play between like the lion and leopard cubs mm -hmm. whenever the time gets, or like, um kind of like a uh, baby birds that are moving around right um, yeah i have so many questions about that because that's something i rarely hear about yeah um, like i think the closest thing i can think of is like in certain nature documentaries they have like baby elephants kind of go off and kind of mess around with animals and stuff. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> but uh yeah that, that's very few and far between anyway so uh yeah definitely very curious about that um it's kind of a parallel situation in anthropology. Like you don't usually when you read about organisms in popular culture, the, the babies kind of get kind of pushed to the sidelines. That's a true. Bit. Yeah. Like if anything, you'll, like you'll get like you know gestation periods and and uh, like general activities of play, but like they don't go too deep into it. That's right. You know, yeah. What, what is daily life like mm -hmm. for the young of a given species? Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, that's definitely like an untapped territory, I think. If you know authors want to get you know going on that sort of yeah. on those sorts of, sorts of studies or, or book projects, that's a good I'd point. Certainly, be there. Like we're we're just now getting that in paleoanthropology. Mm -hmm. A new book had come out earlier this year about Paleolithic children that I'm very curious in checking out. But uh, yeah, definitely really excited about this paper. Um, but I think it's time now for our last study, mm -hmm. which is your September paper, yeah. and uh, I'm very excited to hear about this one. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see where it is. Um, yeah, so this is a, um, a study about an extinct animal, so we're, there are no, no living members of this group. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a very interesting and curious little animal that we're going to talk about today. Um, so... 
This is the skeleton of a reptile called Coelurosaurus, and uh, I would say if you're a paleo nerd uh, and have read a lot of paleontology-related popular books, you've probably encountered this creature before at some point. Um, and uh, indeed, it has even made a notable pop culture appearance. Um, so in the um, uh, had a science fiction. Um, drama series, I suppose, uh, that, uh, you know, aired in the 2000s, I want to say, uh, Primeval. It was a Brit British um, science fiction television series about uh, unusual time portals that would open up um, all over the place and occasionally extinct or even future animals would kind of wander through and uh, the, that kind of leads to a lot of different types of plots. And one of the recurring creatures on that show uh, was actually this one, uh, Coelurosaurus, uh, which is a very interesting choice. I, I think, yeah, from what I remember, they actually picked a lot of rather obscure species to feature in that series. So they, they didn't start mm -hmm. off with like uh, the most obvious choices um, that you would expect, um, like the most well-known dinosaurs, for example. Like, yeah, there, there was, um, uh, they had a lot of obscure things in there. So, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, like uh, sort of, I guess you could say the, kind of mascot of the series was Coelurosaurus because um, it, I think it appears in the first episode and ends up becoming uh, the pet of some of the main characters. Um, and so, yeah, it, it kind of became a recurring presence on that show. Um, so that that's pretty interesting, and it certainly is a is an in, rather unusual looking animal, as you can you might be able to tell from this figure here already. Um, now, as you uh, as you might notice, uh, what this figure is showing, it's only it's not showing the whole kind of reconstructed skeleton. It's showing uh, basically half of it. So you can see how it's kind of split down the middle on top there. So you know it's not it's not that it only has these like really long bones on its side on only one side. It's, it, it it would have like you know a, another a mirrored um, uh, uh, set on the other. Um, so but but uh, yeah, just just to get that clear. So what was Coelurosaurus anyway? Um, well, contrary to primeval, it was not a lizard. Um, it was part of a group of entirely extinct reptiles called the Wygeltosaurids. And uh, at the moment, we think that these were stem reptiles, so they were not especially close to any of the living reptile groups, so they were not especially close to lizards or to turtles or to crocodilians or to birds. Um, instead, they were probably a group that kind of diverged from their lineage uh, before the origin of any of the living groups. And they are known from, uh, mo mostly from Europe, really, uh, from the Permian of Europe, actually. So they lived um, well over 200 million years ago. However, uh, the, um, there is one, which is this one, actually, Coelurosaurus, which was found in Madagascar. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, and they had several unusual features that are quite noteworthy. Uh, first of all, you, can, you might be able to see this, but behind the skull, they had sort of a little bit of a frill that projected from behind. Um, and the frill had like these little horns kind of going around it. That's pretty gnarly, um, pretty, pretty interesting. It definitely reminds me of like the, uh, the ornamentation that some kinds of lizards today have. Um, so they would, they would have looked pretty curious in life. But of course, the most kind of dramatic uh, feature that they probably had were these like really long bones sticking out of their sides. Um, and um, as unusual as these are, uh, we are pretty confident that there is a, a pretty decent modern analog for this. And these are uh, the lizards of the genus Draco, which live in Southeast Asia today. Um, and you might have heard them being called flying lizards or flying dragons, um, if you're an animal nerd. Um, so these lizards um, are very cool. Uh, they're very cool looking. Um, now, most of the time when they're just hanging around and they, they mostly live in trees, uh, they look a lot like, you know, your average lizard. And many of them mostly look, you know, brown for most part. They're, kind of, they're fairly well camouflaged. Um, but uh, when they want to get to another tree, uh, they have a very cool trick. And that's the, they can extend their ribs out to the sides, and in between the ribs uh, are flaps of skin that form a membrane that they can use to actually glide with. So they can kind of stick out their ribs out to the side and then jump off the tree and kind of sail to a different you know, tree that they want to get to. Um, 
And in this way, they can travel throughout the forest without having to climb all the way down to the ground and then climb back up again, which is potentially uh, you know, not only time consuming, but also dangerous. Um, so a really handy way to get around. And it seems that the Ygeltisaurids were doing something very similar. Um, but uh, they're uh, kind of these membrane support structures, these unusual long bones, do not seem to have been formed out of the ribs, um, at least not your typical regular ribs that form your ribcage. Um, so that in that way, they are unlike the Draco lizards. Um, so what are these bones anyway? Well, that is uh, one of the things that this study set out to uh, um, investigate. Um, so uh, the authors of this new study uh, decided to take a new look at what we call the postcranial skeleton of Celerosaurus. So there are three previously um, described specimens of this animal, and they took a more detailed look at all of them to try and see if there were any aspects of its anatomy um, that uh, hadn't really been reported before or reconstructed before. Um, and uh, in the study, they focus on the postcranial skeleton. So that would be the, the part of the skeleton that is everything behind the head. And the reason for this is because in an earlier paper, I think from like about a year or two ago, they already did a redescription of the skull of Cedrus Arava. So they didn't have to do it this time. Um, so uh, yeah, so in this time, uh, this time around, they kind of focused on uh, studying the postcranial skeleton. So the vertebrae and the limbs and also kind of associated bones like the, uh, these really strange, really long um, a bone for, for supporting the, the gliding membrane, um, and uh, these kinds of uh, these kinds of studies are, you know, I, I always like to see these kinds of uh, what we call redescriptions of fossil organisms because, uh, you know, uh, authors from before can make mistakes, uh, and also uh, we can learn new things about about these animals uh, in the meantime. For example, um, a lot of the other species of Ygeltosaurus have actually been uh, redescribed or described in detail recently. Um, so, you know, there, we have a lot of new information about the other ones, so they might as well take a look at this one um, it, within that context. Um, and hopefully that can, you know, tell us a bit more not only about the anatomy of these animals, but also about their ecology and phylogenetic position. Um, so, of course, um, the, the problem with this kind of study, even though it's very scientifically valuable, is that they, they can be a little difficult and dry to describe because, uh, you know, to, to others in a kind of popular um, outreach context, uh, because it's mostly just them kind of going through and talking about a lot of anatomical details. But um, nonetheless, uh, there, I think there are still some pretty interesting takeaways we can get from this that would be of interest to um, more a more uh, casual audience, perhaps. Um, namely some of their interpretations about how um, these animals um, uh, were structured and perhaps uh, what their ecology was like. And so, um, yeah, what did these authors think of these long uh, patagial bones, as they're called, um, that supported the gliding membrane? Well, um, the authors consider it plausible that, as has been suggested by another team quite recently, um, that these patagial bones in Ygeltosaurids um, indeed were not the uh, main kind of rib cage kind of ribs, but instead uh, formed out of components of what we call the gastralia. Um, these are um, sometimes called belly ribs because they kind of form a mirror image uh, to the, the rib cage, except they're along the belly. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, we don't have belly ribs, uh, we uh, mammals do not, but uh, a lot of reptiles do. Um, and yeah, it seems that it's possible that these are modified uh, belly ribs. And indeed, it seems that the uh, uh, patagial bones of Ygeltosaurids would have been positioned kind of close to the underside of their body. And you can see that in the side view here um, on the bottom. Incidentally, uh, this apparently is the first reconstruction of a Ygeltosaurid skeleton in side view. So this is a kind of rare uh, perspective that you get uh, for one of these animals. And yeah, you can see that you know, you, because the potato bones are so thin, you can't really make them out, out very well in, in side view. But you can see that you know, they're positioned along the bottom of the body and not, not towards the top as they would be uh, for the dorsal ribs. Um, so, yeah, it does seem possible that they are modified components of the gastralia. Uh, however, the authors also say that further research will be required to confirm this. So it is, it is indeed a plausible idea and arguably the most uh, plausible idea for the origin of these structures. But uh, 
uh, they are still not uh, completely confident in that. Next, uh, they also wanted to talk about um, but what this might tell us about the uh, the lifestyle of Coelurosaurus and potentially other Ligaldosaurids. Um, and so from their redescription, they were able to confirm that uh, Coelurosaurus had a rather flattened body, and you can you kind of see that in the side view too. Uh, yeah, it's, it's rather flat. Um, it's also got uh, fairly long uh, hands and feet, and these are characteristics that are commonly found in uh, tree-dwelling reptiles. So this confirms that uh, why Gautasaurids were most likely to be tree dwellers. Um, having a flattened body means that they can keep their center of gravity close to um, you know, the trunk or the, the branch that they're sitting on. And so that, you know, that's uh, pretty important if you don't want to fall off something um, as, you, as you would um, if you're a tree dwelling animal. Um, and of course, uh, kind of having long hands and feet help you, helps you grip onto um, these surfaces as well. So yeah, uh, of course, previously, because these were gliding animals, we had already kind of assumed they would have been tree dwellers um, because pretty much uh, nearly all dedicated uh, gliders on land are tree dwellers. Um, however, uh, you know, having this extra information from the postcranial skeleton gives us um, additional lines of evidence beyond just the, uh, the gliding aspect. They were also able to confirm a very unusual anatomical feature that had been previously um, found in other white Geltosaurids, but had not been known in Coelurosaurus until now. And that was the fact that Coelurosaurus had an additional bone, it had an extra bone in the fifth finger, so that would be equivalent to our pinky finger, the outermost finger, um, that is not found in you know, other types of reptiles. Um, and this is found in all um, Wygeltosaurids. And the authors um, suggest that the significance of this trait might have to do with the gliding behavior of these animals. Um, and here, uh, they also kind of used Draco lizards as an analog. Um, because if you look at pictures of Draco lizards gliding, you can see this. Um, you know, if, you, if you haven't seen any pictures or video of them gliding, you, you should look them up because they look quite spectacular. They're um, kind of uh, uh, gliding membranes are often very brightly colored with like reds or yellows, uh, very cool looking. Uh, but something that you might not immediately notice at, at first glance is that when they're gliding, Draco lizards will actually uh, grasp on to the leading edge of their gliding membranes with their forelimbs. Um, and so they, they kind of grab onto the, the leading edge of the forelimbs to help extend the, the membrane to its fullest extent, but also to sort of give them some control over their, uh, their wings, uh, so to speak. Um, so they, can, they kind of tug on the, the leading edge of the uh, gliding membrane to maybe control their direction of travel or their speed and things like that. Uh, and yeah, it's a pretty, pretty neat little kind of uh, behavior. And so the author suggests that perhaps um, the Wygeltosaurids were doing something quite similar, and indeed um, their forelimbs are certainly long enough to reach the, um, the gliding membrane, and it is possible that this kind of extension of the fifth finger uh, kind of allowed them to hold on to the uh, membrane a bit better. Um, so it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a wingsuit, really, uh, even though the wings are kind of sticking, are kind of attached to the sides of their bodies, uh, they can also kind of control them a little bit uh, with, the, with the forelimbs um, as well, which is pretty neat. And so, in light of that, uh, the authors apparently commissioned a, uh, a reconstruction or a restoration of how Coelurosaurus might have looked in life, which they included in their paper, and I reproduced on the next slide. Uh, and so you can see here's a reconstruction of two of these animals. Uh, one of them is hanging out in a tree, as we think they most likely did most of the time, and another one is um, using the hypothesized gliding posture that the authors suggested with the forelimbs gripping onto the gliding membrane. Um, and yeah, that's really cool. Um, something else that's worth mentioning about these animals is that they are the first example of um, actual gliding vertebrates that we have in the fossil record, like the oldest examples of such. They remember they lived all the way back in the Permian. Um, all the other gliding um, vertebrates that we know of, um, or as I say, gliding um, tetrapods that we know of, um, are from the uh, Triassic onwards. So yeah, these are the oldest uh, tetrapods that we know of to have adopted this kind of lifestyle. Um, and they are also some of the oldest tetrapods we know of that were probably um, dedicated tree dwellers. So very neat. Um, do you have anything to add to this? Well, I'll tell you what, this is a freaking cool paper. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really flushes out these animals mm -hmm. for me. Um, cause yeah, you're right. I mean, like, it, it, paleo nerds like us like this, this is a fairly common presence in many of our childhoods i'm sure 
um, just to kind of see like an actual like full description mm. of the skeleton like this that really just unveils so many details. It's just really refreshing and neat to see. Um, I actually genuinely did not know that Draco lizards would fly or I guess would glide like that. Mm -hmm. They kind of like hold the wing membrane. Yeah. <laughs> like kind of like turn it. Like that is, I guess I haven't looked at Draco flight closely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm familiar with Draco lizards. Right. They like, um, in a lot of the really old books about reptiles, they always mention Draco volans, but That's there's right. like 40 species of these things. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they always kind of show it like, with its limbs kind of like splayed out mm -hmm. like whee! yeah yeah <laughs> the membrane would be out but i guess that's not accurate at all because they were they're, they're kind of helping themselves along right with their four limbs. um wow <laughs> yeah it's that's, a, that's such a fun image and like it kind of makes sense if this is like the first tree dwelling slash gliding vertebrate yeah <laughs> yeah you're right because I, I never really thought about you know the how the forelimbs were positioned in the gliding draco either until i read this paper and i looked at some photos and i'm like oh yeah they do do that <laughs> like it's 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 like and it's of course it's amazing too that it kind of took so late for um an animal to kind of take to the trees like this right yeah <laughs> because i mean you think about like the carboniferous swamps like, mm -hmm. like yeah like there were like amphibian-esque creatures of all sorts during those times but i guess none of them that we know of ever kind of took to the trees yeah <laughs> i mean it's probably because like there were you know giant flying insects around that were <laughs> probably a, 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 a probably a danger um i mean dragonflies are predators so, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, imagine like a, a seagull or hawk sized right. fly with the jaws on that thing um <laughs> So I, yeah, I guess that, that 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 makes sense in that case. But um, no, that's 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 really fascinating. And so possibly Gastralia mm. to explain the wings. Yeah, because um, um, I think the character was Rex in yeah. in a Primeval. Uh -huh. They kind of had him kind of flapping about. That's right. Like yeah, a, I think he could actually fly. Yeah, <laughs> which was uh, I think I remember even like as a kid, I was like that doesn't. That's not right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but uh, then again, you know, I do have to applaud that series. Um, I rewatched it. Yeah, we we, we rewatched it. Like, I don't know if you were with us for that. Hmm. A bunch of our friends got together and we we watched that first season. Oh yeah. Uh, I think that was last year, um, or sometime during COVID time. Um, and uh, honestly, for me, it did not age well at all. <laughs> but uh, I will applaud the show for their use of obscure taxa, as mm -hmm. you described, because. Yeah, that the premiere episode was all Permian creatures. They had a right. um, Scutosaurus, a, a Pariasaur, which is like a a, a very stem reptile. Mm -hmm. Like I, I um, it's a, a para reptile, I think is what right. it's yeah. called. Um, and then like the big, the big kind of highlight was a, a Gorgonopsian, right. which is a um, a synapsid proto mammal which is uh, you know one of the top predators of the time. Very fascinating group. Big canines, very dog-like, but also not. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the, the evidence that we have now is like they probably were not furry-like mammals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like the, they, but, but like if you look at them, like they move, they would have moved like mammals mm. in a way. Right, like, right. They had a, a, the limbs underneath the body. Um, in a very mammalian fashion mm -hmm. and uh, they they um but like they they also i i believe the vertebrae were not flexible like mammals mm -hmm. so like they were still kind of moving in a side to side kinda. yeah a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah so it's they're kind of like a weird mix right which probably explains why like they were called mammal like reptiles for exactly a long time. <laughs> uh, of course that's a very broad definition of reptile that really would mean amniote today yeah. mm -hmm. um you never really see the mammal-like reptile use anymore mm -hmm. it's probably for a good thing it's you know a good thing i think yeah. mm -hmm. um, but uh no very fascinating it, it's cool to see this animal fleshed out more um and uh, i don't know about you but is that a um a third eye oh on the 
yeah uh, I, I i believe it is um and yeah uh, this um, the, the third eye is actually a feature that um, a lot of vertebrates um, have um, ancestrally of course you, you only tend to hear about it talked uh, about uh, in regards to uh, tuatara which is a very unusual kind of reptile that lives in new zealand today um, looks like a lizard but isn't even though it is closely related to them um and uh yeah but uh, that's that's a feature that is not a uh, unique to the tuatara it's actually found in a lot of different types of vertebrates including a lot of different reptiles and so yeah i guess they decide to highlight it here with the uh, with the uh, cedar serapis <laughs> well very fitting well it goes to show that this is a you know, very well researched paleo art and mm. follows the paper closely um that's cool. I'll have to get this image of Solar Saravis in my head <laughs> um, from now on because it's a what a cool animal, a very fascinating animal. Um, actually, what's really funny is I think uh, it still kind of has a, a big presence in popular culture, mm. um, at least in in some aspects. Um, so I follow some groups on Instagram where they collect animal figurines uh -huh. and toys, you know, because you know kids these days they got it made really well with animal figurines. <laughs> and, for us adults as well who like to collect some of the, like the more museum quality ones uh, it can be a real fun experience um but uh, there's a company playmobile that mm, oh, yeah. uh, they're not like legos right. um they're kind of like i don't know if dollhouses is the right word where like they, they, they have like the little accessories already made and you just, you kind of put yeah, them yeah, together yeah. and you you kids can go and make a make up stories with with the little people figurines and stuff yeah. but they, they have some like prehistoric sets with like dinosaurs and stuff um and like some of their choices for like little ambient animals that they put mm. in the background right. are solar oh wow <laughs> yeah I, I don't think I, I knew about that that's pretty cool i i do remember playmobile like i, I do remember seeing it I, I think i might have even had a few of the figurines especially the the animal ones but yeah wow oh yeah i have a a set of orangutans <laughs> nice. that I have in one of my potted plants. Um, <laughs> it's like it's cool the attention to detail. Yeah. Um, and like a simple toy like this is, is appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, oh wow! So like somebody on that team knew about this animal and was like, hey, let's use these. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're cool. <laughs> and I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad that they did. Uh, hopefully, more kids learned about Solarosaurus, and mm -hmm. then we can have more cool studies in the future yeah. just like this exactly <laughs> oh well that's wonderful um did you, have, did you have anything else you wanted to add oh and uh, not really i think okay well then i think this is about a good time as any uh this is the to kind of announce like the end of our episode um i hope you all enjoyed the stories that we covered today um it's always a treat to um like find cool news stories to talk about mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's it's a special challenge for episodes like this where we're picking like one per month right because you know imagine like one good month full of stories now imagine two where you have to pick from all of those and it's like oh, oh man <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> there, there were a couple that we were we, we were kind of going back and forth mm -hmm. on but i'm very happy with the ones that we picked here yeah um but of course that is it for our series um of course if we go to the next slide we'll have our usual closing out section um we are on patreon so if you are interested in you know donating any monetary amount uh, that will go to help us continue these series that we've been producing and develop new projects and expansions so that's patreon.com forward slash time and clades and um, where we have and we have different tier options there if you want to you know kind of get involved with special perks to kind of help out help us out with the show um, we have four patrons currently, and they are all on a tier where they are owed a shout out. So we want to thank uh, my sister Julie, and my partner Alari, our good friend Denver, and our patron Paul. Um, we really appreciate all your help, and uh, we always look forward to hearing from you all whenever a new episode comes out. Uh, of course, in terms of general acknowledgments, we want to thank our friends Henry and Alicia for their contributions to this series. Henry is behind the wonderful theme music that always opens up our episodes. And uh, Alicia is responsible for the color scheme of Albert's Alvarezor avatar. And of course, we want to thank all of you again for getting us to over a thousand subscribers. Um, just really big highlight of the year um, among many, many highlights. And uh, we appreciate all of y'all's support. Um, now, of course, we are on Twitter and you can go to at Time and Clades 
just see just general updates and postings of episodes, but most likely you are watching us on our YouTube page through Time and Clay. So if you want to subscribe, um, you are more than welcome to do so. And if you have any questions for us about the stories that we covered on this episode or just anything in particular, you can leave an email, timeandclades at gmail.com, or you can comment on our comment section, or you can leave us a tweet on Twitter. Um, and of course, uh, if you want to read any of these papers that we talked about, they will be in the description in our references that you can go and explore more of them. And with that, that is the end of our episode. Um, let's see, what's next? Um, well, it is spoopy month, mm -hmm. and uh, Albert, now that you are kind of settling in, mm -hmm. you know, more and more, um, we'll probably be back for a regular October episode. Yeah, you probably. Think? Probably, yeah. And uh, I am working on a new special episode. Um, can't talk about what it is yet. It's not a review. <laughs> um, but it, it, it will be the first of our episodes to cover a single topic. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I will leave that as a surprise for everyone. But I'm sure it will be appreciated. And probably a very um, curious topic for many of our viewers who happen to own certain animals. But uh, I, I will I will leave it at that. Um, thank you all for joining us so much. We hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, indeed. Take care, everybody.